English, right? Got okay, anything else? Um, one thing I find really common when I talk to folks who make biodiesel in different parts of the country is that their solution for dealing with these side streams is to save them. Uh, and it's, it's often uh, a, a dirty little secret, and you see this look on their face. And after they've been talking for half an hour about how great their system is, I ask, what do you do with your biodiesel concern? And they say, oh yeah, we, what we do with it is, our solution is, what will we, um, we put it in barrels? How bad? <laughs> And I literally talked to a guy in Alabama who had been putting all of his glycerin into the barrels that the methanol came in and storing it in the woods. He said, what I did was, in case one of them spilled, I put down about six inches of wood chips, made this pad, so now I've got 50 barrels of biodiesel glycerin in a special place in the woods. And I'm thinking one day I'll make it in soap or something like this. Wow. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is first the operation where I work, how we make biodiesel. Then I'm going to talk about how we compost our side streams because we have this luxury. I'm going to talk a little bit about gray water. What is gray water? That term. People use it kind of loosely, but it's got a pretty specific definition. I'm going to talk about biodiesel wash water within it. And then I'm going to give my two examples of how I have used wetlands, constructed wetlands, to treat wash water from biodiesel. One I call the IBC wetland, and two is Lake Okefenokee. And folks who remember the comic strip, Pogo, where there's a possum, Pogo, where he lived, it was called Okefenokee Swamp. So. The reason we're called Pogo, oil, by the way, my boss's name is Pogo. So we use B100 for equipment. It's mostly equipment for tree service operation. So that's a lot of heavy equipment, front end loaders, bulldozers, grinders, chippers, shredders, screeners. And you'll see some of that equipment like this. We're running B100 in about 30 or 40 pieces of heavy equipment. We have uh, our own fueler truck, actually. it's from the air park in Montgomery County. It was old, it had been abandoned for a couple of years, so we got it for a special price of free. But as you may know, free cars and trucks are sometimes the most expensive. Um, it needed a lot of work. It didn't run and it had some leaks, and so uh, we fooled around with it and got it going. But it's a thousand gallon tanker truck. I like it because it used to be Esso, and then it was Exxon, but now it's Pogolon. This is the way we make our biodiesel. And I think it's important to just talk about this in the context of our wash water because wash water is not wash water is not wash water. The way we make our biodiesel, we make about 700 gallons a week in a single stage base catalyzed batch production. Our catalyst is KOH, 22% methanol. We use fryer oil as our feedstock. We react it for three hours at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's our reaction temperature. We have a static mixer. So as an apple seed processor provides agitation for the reaction using the pump for circulation, we use the pump in addition to a static mixer to provide extra reaction agitation so that we get a good conversion rate. So that we're going to hit our glyceride content maximum within the ASTM spec. Although we don't get our fuel tested to ASTM, we aspire to be that good coffee. We also do a 5% free wash remix. Anyone unfamiliar with that? Okay, 5% free wash remix is a relatively new development for home brewers. The idea is after you've done your reaction, you've done your three hours, you would be ready to settle the glycerin now. You add 5% the volume of the vegetable oil you add in water. So for 100 gallons of vegetable oil in your reaction, you would add five gallons of clean water right at the end. Mix that in for another 15 minutes and then let it settle. And it provides some pretty neat advantages. One is that it pre-washes it. It'll actually grab some of the soap and contaminants that are in your body and make them settle out with the glycerin much faster. Two is it'll stop the reaction immediately. 
so you won't have to worry so much about a reverse reaction, some of your glycerin going back into vegetable oil, into glycerin, glycerides. And then also it provides a little bit of, I'd say, a modicum of safety. It'll prevent so much of your methanol vapors from being released because now a lot of that methanol is dissolved into water. Um, residual methanol. Does that reduce the amount of methanol that's in your fuel then because it puts more of it in the glycerin? It does help reduce that, but we also take more steps to get that methanol out of the fuel. Question? So that 5% was 5% of the total amount that's in the reactor? or So it's probably sort of somewhat arbitrary, but the way I describe it is, say you're doing 100 gallons of vegetable oil, and you're going to be adding 22 gallons of methanol. So your reaction at the end, you're going to add 5 gallons of water because you had 100 gallons of vegetable oil. Here's our reactor. You can see it's um, covered with black plastic and under that is insulation. But under that is a 500 gallon steel tank. It's a cylinder. It's actually an old used motor oil tank. Flat on the top and the bottom. Set uh, on the back, there's a one by four underneath it. So it tilts slightly forward. So it drains here, almost as if it's cone bottom. It's set up in a wooden frame. Because I cannot recommend, it's not really a good safety uh, feature, but that's the way it is. And it follows much of the same principles as an appleseed style reactor, water heater style. Circulating out of the bottom, up through this pump, and it pumps back and drops to the top again. Circulating constantly to provide the agitation for the reaction. This here is a static mixer, six inch long piece of pipe with a set of baffles inside it. I built it. I'll show you how to do it if you want later on. Cool. I'm very proud of it. Um, this is a sight, sight glass along the side that shows me the level, the, fuel, the liquid that's inside the tank. You can see right now it's full of 400 gallons. Since it's a 500 gallon tank, I react 400 gallons of vegetable oil at a time. About 85 gallons of the methyl oxide it leaves about 15 gallons of headspace at the top to provide space for the agitation. There's no agitators inside. All the agitation is coming through the mixing path. But there's also four heating elements, one here, one on this side, three, four, around it. They're providing the heat, bringing it up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. They're just electric hot water heater elements. They're 240 volt elements. They're at 40, 500 watts each. So it heats up 400 gallons of vegetable oil, on a spring day in about three hours. Uh, so after I react it here in the reactor, I pump it up into these two, one of these two tanks. They're the same size, each 500 gallons, alternate days, and I let the glycerin settle out there. Then I drain the glycerin out here, outside into glycerin storage tanks. Then I can drain the biodiesel out once I see the glycerin's gone. Using this hose, I connect it up here to my wash tank. There's a port on the side of this tank. That's where I do my water wash. I'll show that in a second. So my procedure is react, settle, water wash, air dry, pure light polish, and then filter, store it here, and then pump it outside so it can be used in the equipment. Here's how the mist washing works. I use a mist wash system, not a bubble wash. I spray the water in through this misting manifold in the top of the tank. The water just gently sinks down through the biodiesel because we know oil floats on water. As that water sinks down in a mist, so each of the particles of water are very small, each one of those particles of water grabs some contaminants. Almost all of our contaminants are water soluble. So it can sink down, grab those contaminants, rinse it out, the water sinks to the bottom. It's just well water. The total per percent volume of water that I'm doing is about 60%. And I do it this way. For 700 gallons of fuel, I do a 100 gallon wash, I drain it off, another 100, I drain it off, and then I do a 200 gallon wash. Why? It's kind of arbitrary. The primary goal of this mist wash is actually to rinse out the methanol, the excess methanol that remains in my biodiesel. I don't do methanol recovery on that. 
I just rinse it out, and we take that water out and we compost it. Once I've rinsed out that excess methanol, the soaps are much less able to stick in that biodiesel. And so later when I air dry it, I'll show you in a second, the soaps will fall right out. But so I drain that wash water out the bottom here, this is a sight glass here, and I pump it outside into my dirty water storage tank, my wash water storage tank. Through this sight glass, I'm watching, and as soon as water is finished going through it, there'll be a section of soapy, emulsiony kind of crap that comes through. It's very creamy, and then the biodiesel will come out. So I'll shut that valve, and then I'll transfer over here and pump that now washed biodiesel into my air drying tank. Here's my air dryer. The way it works is there's heavy duty air blower on the top. It sounds like a jet, it's pretty fantastic. <laughs> and this air hose goes down to the bottom, there's a loop, I just zip tied it together and I drilled a bunch of holes in it. So that's my bubbler now. In the bottom here, filled up with 700 gallons of biodiesel, I blow that air at a really heavy duty flow rate for about a day. The moist air from that is now going off through this exhaust fan, through this hose, to the outdoors. And I'm also simultaneously circulating out of the bottom of this pump and spraying it back in the top to give it a lot more surface area so that it can evaporate moisture off of that biodiesel. At the end of the day, I turn it off and the next morning, I'll drain out soap that's fallen out of that biodiesel into a bucket and I can put that into my residual tank. So I'll do that twice and by the end of the second day, the third morning, I drain off the soap It'll be very, very little. The biodiesel is clear now. And most people would actually use that biodiesel or consider it good. We actually run it through a pyrolite column here. This is about three feet tall, about a foot diameter. And it's filled with pyrolite beads. It'll uh, provide a polish, catch a little bit more soap that might still be in that biodiesel. But it's almost redundant. Question? How long is your product uh, last time? How long is a pure light lasting? We've probably run 2,000 gallons through it, so it's a new step for us. Mm -hmm. um, I expect it to last for a long time, but I don't know. Maybe 10,000 gallons, maybe 50,000 gallons, because we're washing it first, and we're drying it, and we're draining the soaps out. It's a polish. So it's a polish, exactly. It flows very slowly through it, though. You can see there's a pressure gauge here. Um, it flows at about one gallon per minute. So the crux of this talk is going to be about our side streams and specifically the wash water. I just want to show you where they are outside of my facility. The previous pictures were inside this building. The things that were pumping out, you saw the glycerin drains out into these storage tanks. These are just IBCs. And the term IBC I'm going to be using for this presentation, some people will call them totes, but I've actually heard about six things here referred to as totes. So uh, IBC is the technical name for these. It's an intermediate bulk container. That's that crude biodiesel glycerin. This is our finished product, that, that good B100 to use in the equipment. Over here is the oil that's come from the restaurants. That's our Ferrari oil, and it's settling in a cone bottom tank to get the water and the crud to fall out. Then this tank is that wash water. And I pump just directly into here, it's a thousand gallon steel tank. Uh, that's just a holding tank for it, so I make sure it doesn't overflow onto the ground before I uh, process it again. This is the compost yard. This is where we compost most of our side streams. These piles are 12 feet tall. They're like 300 feet long. Here is mulch. Here is some playground mulch. Here is wood chips. This is compost. Next to it is topsoil. These are um, uh, just big chunks of wood that are going to go through a grinder. And then these are a lot of compost piles that are going to be turned into nice compost that we sell. And we sell all this stuff by the tractor trailer load. Where I compost the side streams that I produce is back here. This is where the freshest stuff that's just come in from landscapers or other tree services or our own tree service. That's where it gets taken back. It's uh, landscaping material. Uh, leaves, grass, 
and a whole lot of ground up trees and branches and um, material like that. Um, from the time that material comes in back here to be composted to the time that it's sold here as fine compost is actually about 18 months. So here's what I do with my crude biodiesel glycerin. And it has methanol in it. It's just, just as it settled out of my reaction, I compost it. Take it back with one of our New Holland skid loaders. I dig a trough. I didn't have a picture of this, but I'll take one of the front end loaders. I'll dig a trough in the side of one of these giant compost piles. Then I'll put the IBC glycerin on the edge of that trough. And I drain it right in there. And it fills up this trough. Usually put only one per trough. When it's, when it's emptied out, I cover that whole trough with more compost. Maybe like 50 or 75 more cubic yards of compost. The idea there is that the bottom of this pile, of this trough here that I've dug, is about four feet off the ground. And then when I put more compost on top of it, I'm turning that where the glycerin is into the middle of the compost pile. That's where the real microorganism activity is. It does the decomposition. That's where it's hottest. That's where there's the biggest populations of microorganisms. They're going to eat that stuff up. Uh, we found that it eats it up really quite quickly. We also compost the majority of the wash water that we produce. The first thing we do is, coming from that big green 1,000-gallon uh, steel tank that you saw, we drain it into a, oh, this is actually the next slide. I just wanted to show you that we take it down there and compost it. But we have a grease trap set up. So we'll drain from that 1,000 gallon steel tank into this grease trap here to catch any biodiesel that might be in with that wash water or that might have been in that soapy emulsion layer that's separated out over time. That's great because we don't want to waste that and also because we don't want to compost it. We would only want to compost the dirty water, especially in our constructed wetlands. This is how the grease trap works. The water drains into this tank, goes down to the bottom, and then comes over into this tank. And the oil floats on the top, so only the water is going over to the next tank. Does that make sense? So we'll do the same sort of thing with the dirty water. Take it out, open the valve uh, port at the top, open the valve at the bottom, and it starts spraying, draining into the side of the compost pile. For the wash water, we don't dig a trough, we just top dress it. It'll really soak into the tank uh, piles, and the piles are really benefiting a lot from having all that extra moisture. So sort of move it back and forth and top dress it along the side of the pile. As high up as we can get. Okay, now I'm going to talk about gray water. What is gray water? I did a fair amount of research prevent, uh, preparing for this talk, and what I found people talking about in the category of gray water was water from residential uh, applications, or maybe an apartment building or an office building. They're talking about water from the sink, from washing their hands. They're talking about shower water and laundry water, things like that. Uh, water is mostly going to have soap, shampoo, uh, phosphate shampoo, um, it's going to have nitrates, um, and these are things that are going to make it okay for plants, but inappropriate for dumping right into a waterway, especially the nitrates. You might have heard of eutrophication. Eutrophication is when there's too many nutrients in a waterway, it'll create a really wonderful place for algae to bloom, and they'll cover the surface of the water and suffocate out all the light in pull out a lot of the oxygen and prevent anything underneath uh, other plants or fish from living there. Uh, toilet water, uh, poop and pee, that falls in the category of black water, so that's not what we're talking about here. And um, what's neat about gray water is it's also got like, you know, skin flakes and whatnot. That's great nutrients for plants, all the kind of particulates um, that will get treated like um, that can even be landfilled out of a city's sewer system. Uh, in this case, they can be fed to plants, and plants will love it. So it can be used for irrigation. 
So did you say that uh, gray water is ideal for algae growth? Is that, is that what you said? Um, that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. It would be. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. Like With all the phosphates and nitrates, man, you got a sure. biological goodies. And a lot of um, sewage treatment facilities have tons and tons of algae growing to treat that water. Lindsay? Um, the legal definition of gray water includes kitchen sink and black kitchen. water. Mm -hmm. Kitchen sink. Kitchen toilet. So, oh, say the last kitchen part. sink is black water. Kitchen it's sink great. is black water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. If you have a, a don't have a garbage disposal, disposal, it, it is falls in that gray area. It's in that dark gray. Area. Yeah. Dark, dark gray. <laughs> dark Actually, they gray. call it dark gray. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's an example of a gray water system for a person's house. Um, at the top is a utility sink. And then they've got the water diverted, so it can go directly down into the sewer system. But the way they've got it set up, it's going through uh, sand filters. These are just uh, one 55 gallon drum cut in half. Uh, sand filters, and then um, these are catching particulates and uh, some other nasties that might not want to go directly into the um, plants here. And eventually it comes down into a reed bed. This is an old bathtub and it's filled up with gravel and then a couple inches of mulch soil and then plants, cattails and whatnot. And then here, it's connected to a garden hose where it drains out and they use it for watering and garden. The biodiesel wash water is different from gray water. Biodiesel wash water has mostly water in it, but also excess methanol and that can be poisonous. Um, residual KOH, potassium, hydroxide. Uh, that's what I use. Some people use sodium hydroxide, but one advantage of using potassium is you find on fertilizer bags the NPK rating case the potassium. Potassium is a big advantage for plants and I can help them grow faster. And you'll see in some of my pictures later on. It's also got soaps that you created as a side reaction when you're making biodiesel. And some dissolved glycerin that you're rinsing out of your biodiesel when you wash. Anything else I might have left out somebody knows that's in biodiesel wash water? Some particulate matter. Some particulate matter can be in there, that's right. So the first system that I'm going to talk about is the IBC wetland. And this you also might have seen featured in Biodiesel Smarter in uh, issue number five. I did a little spread on it, but you're going to get more information than these people did. In this, talk. Uh, this is how I made it. I took a, an old IBC and I took a sawzall and I cut out the top. And now I've turned it into a big aquarium tank. I took a, uh, actually this is going to be better pictures than it's in a minute. Um, here's the IBC. I took a tub. Uh, this is like for horse feeding, I think. It came from a store called Tractor Supply. And filled it mostly with um, gravel, pea gravel and uh, some other river rocks. And then I put a crate here. What I really wanted, I didn't realize it then, but it was just a bucket with the bottom cut out. But instead we took this crate and we put plastic around the sides of it. Um, this is a guy who showed me how to do it. His name is Jim and he used to work with a man named John Todd in Vermont. John Todd is a pioneer of these things they call living machines, using natural systems to clean up dirty water, and especially, in his case, polluted with waterways, um, streams and rivers, creeks, things like that. There's a book about him. It's called Chattanooga Sludge. Really recommended, though it's out of print, you can find it online. It's a children's book, but it tells a story in a really great way uh, with some beautiful collages. Uh, just about his systems using uh, tanks with all kinds of plants and fish and algae. And we used it as a guide for what we did. And it talks a lot about the different organisms and the chemical processes that are happening. Um, the, one thing that's kind of charming about it is um, in the beginning he put in too high concentration of uh, his contaminants and killed a bunch of fish and um, frogs. And so he's got the angels of the fish and the frogs that tell you what's going on. <laughs> so this is the basic setup. It's uh, about 250 gallons of water and a tub. Uh, the first one I said I bought that tub. Uh, this one is an old home heating oil tank, the 275 oval 
cross section type, cut it in half lengthwise and made it into two tubs. And just put plastic uh, inside of them just to keep it um, from leaking and also from getting contaminated with rust. I wasn't sure what effect that would have. Again, I filled them up with uh, gravel and river rocks. And then I put a couple layer, a couple inches of soil um, uh, compost and mulch on the top. And then I went and got a bunch of plants. Uh, these are cattails and some different grasses and reeds and sedges uh, and, and stuff them in there. Plant them. There's a bucket sunk in here, and you'll see that in a minute. That's a bucket with no bottom, as I was describing before. And then there's another bucket here with holes drilled in the bottom. You'll see that in a second, and it's filled with wood chips. So the idea is to add the dirty wash water into that bucket filled with wood chips. Dirty wash water comes down and filters through the gravel and the rocks and the roots up the bottom of this bucket with no bottom. There's a pump here and it circulates that water and pumps it into the top tank. And this overflows, then the water comes up this pipe across and back down. So that's providing us almost like uh, what they call rotating stock, getting contact with all the different microorganisms, might be down here, might be up here in the middle, uh, and microorganisms that might be in the top, so the root structure or the bottom of the gravel on the bottom of the tub. Also have an aquarium bubbler to begin with, and then a heavier duty bubbler to provide aeration. Because something interesting about the bio is a wash water, it has a very high BOD, that's the biochemical oxygen demand. And that means that it's sucking, requiring a lot of oxygen out of the water so that it's competing with fish and other creatures, snails that are in the water that also need oxygen. Okay, wait a minute. Yep. Okay, you said the, I'm a little confused, the wash water goes in through the wood chip bucket? Yep. Okay, so that works as a filter. Like and a you just bucket. wait for it to overflow or is there a bottom? There's bottom? holes drilled in the bottom and there's okay. no slide about it. All right. Okay. Where does the water come out? Where does the water come out? <laughs> the water that we add, we're replenishing what evaporates. So water really never comes out of it. That's always been my concept, is just to let the water get it as clean as pond water and uh, treat it like a pond. And it just, you have an evaporation you want to do? We do, about five gallons a day in this system. So here's the pond part of it that IBC would top cut out. We put a lot of water plants in. This strange plant showed up on its own. It must have come on the foot of a bird that flew in to visit. Uh, and it eventually covered the whole surface. So it's my favorite plant, but it hasn't come back this year. Um, these are some water hyacinths. They're actually not native, they're invasive, but uh, I bought them at an aquarium store. And uh, this is water lettuce. The water lettuce didn't last very long. Also got it at an aquarium store. My idea was just to try to put a whole ton of plants and see what survived. Uh, the guy who helped me, who's John Todd's student, said anything that would survive would help. So just add a lot of diversity. You can see goldfish here. This is how that water's draining. As it filled up, it would just come across here through a bulkhead bedding that I put in the side of the tank drain back down into the bottom, go through, circulate, pump back up out of this bucket. This is that bucket again. See the water coming up out of the bottom. How many gallons back into the top? Do you think you ran uh, that little itty bitty like pump? A uh, little itty bitty pump. It costs ten dollars for carbon free. Cool. Hey, do you have a problem with mosquitoes or is the water moving or not? Because the water's moving, we don't have a problem with mosquitoes. Uh, Actually, I never do that. They always bite my wife, so. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the aeration that we add, added for um, those goldfish. Um, it's a bit heavier duty than an aquarium pump. It makes a whole lot of noise when we put it inside. Uh, the little manifold here to set off three different hoses going to the three different IBC wetlands that we've created. I just put a weight at the bottom of it to let it sit down there. If you ever want like a crazy, strange piece of metal, these are in the trash at tree service places. 
there are these teeth that had to be replaced every once in a while. The big chunk of metal. And they get sent off to scrap. But um, kind of neat. So there it is again. Just to remain. The way that I added the wash water, I kept a separate IBC here full of a dirty wash water. Put it up on a couple of pallets to give me the height enough to be able to drain it into a bucket. And then I would pour that bucket of dirty wash water into this bucket full of wood chips. Hey, there's that right here. You can see it's coming out of the bottom. Um, two reasons to do this bucket full of wood chips. One is that it provides that pre-filter, but also it provides a whole new habitat for microorganisms and, in fact, macroorganisms. Um, strange little beetles would live in there. There was some great fungus that grew in there, tiny little parasol mushrooms, and that's just um, another place for microorganisms to start eating up the contaminants that were in the biodiesel, turning it back into nutrients. So I had three different setups. Because I was doing it as an experiment, I had a control that just got tap water. Then I had a tub that I would add tap water one day and wash water the next day and alternate back and forth. So I got half and half. And then I had one that I added pure wash water. Uh, it's important to note that at this point, this was uh, two years ago, where these pictures are from. Uh, at this point, our wash water was a lot less concentrated. Actually, instead of doing what I described earlier, 60% wash water, this point is about 200% compared to the volume of biodiesel. So a lot less concentrated. But as you can see, these plants are pretty scraggly. And so compared to the 50%, they looked a lot better than the control. So the potassium, my theory, is that potassium is helping them to have a lot more vigorous plant growth. And also, a lot greater diversity of plants grew in here than they did in here. Uh, one thing I did, uh, all these plants came from the creek that's down in the driveway uh, on the way into the farm. So they're all native plants, except for those water hyacinths I showed you. All these plants are native plants, and I also got a ton of tadpoles. Tadpoles did okay for a little while. Uh, birds got a lot of them. But some of them grew to be mature frogs. And the frogs liked it in here. They hop back and forth between the different ones, but kind of surprised me. So Lake Okefenokee, this is the big one. This is the scale up that we did. Uh, this is what we just built it this spring, and it's actually still parts of it are not quite beautiful yet. Um, you can see there's a pond liner here. This um, not been trimmed away yet. We're going to build a little uh, monument there, I guess. Some, somebody came by and said, oh, I want to put, I've got these rocks, I'd like to build a little thing, make it look nicer. I said, sure. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we built Lake Okefenokee, partly because I think it's useful and partly because I get to show off some of the neat machinery we have. <laughs> this thing, if anybody ever read the Lorax, it was featured in that book, I think. Um, what it does is uh, it just drives up to a tree, chops it off, and grabs it away. So awful kind of thing. It takes like 10 seconds to take down a bunch of trees. And these things run on B100. This guy, uh, excavator just came and ripped the roots right out of the ground. Kind of extraordinary. And we took it away in compost and grinded it down. So then I got a bunch of old Jersey barriers and I set up a perimeter for where I wanted this pond. Um, we're going to do it above ground a little bit and created at a level so it was appropriate for how we wanted to use it. Took one of our little B100 powered excavators and a buddy of mine who does landscape design came out and helped and sort of sculpted a general basin for our pond. And we wanted a fancy pond but first we had to start with our general basin for it. Dug it and moved it and we got some other dirt from other places and filled up the edges. This here is that um, pond liner just rolled up there. You'll see it again in a minute. So we have Pond Fest 08, and we invited <laughs> maybe like 20 or 30 people came out to help uh, sculpt this pond. And uh, a lot of city people, and they just loved it. Got to use a real shovel. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> what we wanted was.
was this uh, pretty, um, I guess, uh, intricate design for a pond. This is a cross section. The deepest part here, 42 inches deep, about three and a half feet. They wanted a shelf here, about 18 inches deep, where we could put trays, like egg crate trays, have specific kinds of plants that like to be somewhat submerged. And then this little six inch reed bed around the edge, and that's got gravel in it, and a bunch of cattails and reeds. But it's also connected with the pond liner, and the water can flow in and out but up there. In the bottom here is a pump that circulates for the waterfall. And that costs about $100. It's specifically designed for waterfall. It does about 3,200 gallons per hour. We put it in an old cracked up Rubbermaid container because we wanted to put it underneath some gravel and things to prevent crap from jamming it up. And that circulates up to the waterfall. We've also got an air aerator you'll see in a minute. Um, that air bubbler down here in the bottom as well. Any interest in using pumice instead of gravel for around the pump? No, I don't. I don't think that um, it would provide much of an advantage. You think it's because it's porous? Well, uh, for home ponds, uh, it's often recommended to the water for circulation using pumice to keep the uh, pump from mucking up. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we have three ponds at home that they all same system and they never mucked up. Um, so here's some more of the sculpting that we did. Uh, this is the deepest part here, then that shelf that you saw. So then we to put down this pond liner. And uh, honestly, I thought we could just dig a hole and then it would fill up with water like puddles do in the driveway. Why wouldn't that work? But, uh, you know, again, glad that I invited this landscaper. And so we've got this big pond liner out, and this not only allows the pond to hold its water, but also prevents seepage into the water. Because what we're trying to do is treat this dirty water. So we, we wanted it to just evaporate when it turned into clean water. Um, this is where you're going to see uh, the IBC that's full of wash water later on. This is where the waterfall gets put in. You'll recognize that later. And then we put plantings around here. This is Joe, he's here this weekend. So then we started filling it up once we got it in place. Put rocks around the edge to prevent it from sagging in. And we use this water truck. It's an old water truck we have on the farm. We use it to um, bring water to different areas. Um, maybe we need to put water on one of the compost piles, or I think we actually get a discount on our insurance for having it as a water, uh, as a fire truck. We need to. You can use it to water uh, parts of. We had some organic vegetables growing for a time. Uh, but what's great about it is it's this crazy old four-wheel drive, 2,000-gallon tanker, and we could drive it right up to the creek and suck creek water out. So that's what we did. Uh, the advantage of using creek water just that it had all kinds of microorganisms, bacteria, algae already in it, would give us a head start, better than the tap water. Although our tap water is well water, but still, there's a lot of life in here. Give us a head start. Then we got a lot of plants. So we took, you know, a couple of dozen buckets from a grocery store, uh, like a, a food warehouse, and they had feta cheese in them or garlic or whatever, and you could tell by smell on a lot of them. Uh, and I sent everybody down to the creek or to another spot I knew where there was some wetlands plants, and gave it some shovels and had them all bring back these plants. So they're all native plants, and there's, you can see cattails, this is called skunk cabbage, uh, some reeds, reeds were the prize for us, but there's not a lot of reeds around where we are. We've got some. I said anything that was green besides thistles, <laughs> what I wanted. This is how I add the dirty water to the Lake Okefenokee. Uh, I have a reed bed here that's specifically for adding the dirty water. Uh, what it is is about two feet deep of mostly gravel and river rocks, and then some, again, some soil on the top, and a whole bunch of these wetlands plants on the top. This is a two-inch PVC pipe, and along the bottom, it's got holes drilled in it, 
I actually put a piece of silt sock around it as well, just to keep it from getting clogged up. And so from this IBC of dirty wash water, I connect the hose and drain it out. It goes down. You can see it hiding right there, sort of towards the edge of the reed bed. And the idea is that the wash water goes into the reed bed, down into the bottom, comes up, flows over into the pond. So it goes around the pond, it can go in and out of this reed bed along that edge. Then the waterfall pump circulates it up here to the waterfall. Most of it flows back down the waterfall, but a trickle of it goes in here to replenish the reed bed and to also give it a little bit of a rinse, I guess. The dirty wash water, before it goes into the pond, I have it set up with a small aquarium bubbler just to provide a little bit of oxygenation for what I spoke about before, the biochemical oxygen demand, just to reduce that amount of oxygen that it's going to pull out of the water. But it's not enough. It's just a little bit of an extra advantage for it. This is how we add the wash water. Or this is what it looked like when we added it. Just crack the valve a little bit, start into it. Overflow over the edge of that waterfall. Oh, actually right here you can see. The little uh, trickly waterfall here. And into the body of the pond. There's about 40 goldfish in it. You can almost just barely see a couple of them right here. They were swimming through it. They're curious. They were uh, unexperienced. You can see the circulation, and it's a this sort of spiral because of the pump in the bottom. It's going around, coming through that waterfall pump, pumping back up, coming back down the waterfall. This is the little trickly waterfall here. The fish all went to the middle. And it was kind of weird. It's like they're uh, circling the wagons there. And then they got really unhappy. Because there was virtually no oxygen for them to breathe in the pond now, I guess, two hours later, they were all congregated at the bottom of the waterfall. And the waterfall provides some aeration, so they were able to breathe right there. They stayed there. They stayed there for like a day, all of them. And it was really kind of weird, and I know they were unhappy. They were talking about uh, doing a mutiny, I think. And they formed a <laughs> union. Actually, now I work for them. It's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but so I added this aerator. And this is a pretty heavy duty uh, pond aerator. I mean, it's got another one of those little metal chunks to hold it down at the bottom, but provides a whole lot of bubbling. It almost looks like it's boiling now. But the fish are happy and they were able to move away from the bottom of the waterfall and resume their regular activities. So, I am pretty much finished with my talk. Um, this is uh, a great option, I think, for people who have a smaller scale operation. Just set up one of these, use it in your backyard. And then if you wanted to scale up, this is about uh, 50 gallons three times a week that we're adding to this one um, to treat that much wash water. To the one on the To the Lake Okefenokee. Oh. And do you get enough evaporation? Do we get enough evaporation? We get a fair amount of evaporation. I think the 50 gallons uh, three times a week is just replenishing what's evaporating. When it's a rainy week, we're not adding any. What about overflow? Uh, there's a there's a little spot over here where it can overflow, and it just goes down to the driveway there. Question. I mean, eventually, since you're putting in biological matter into the uh, water, it will build up. Well, drunk at the bottom at some point, or any thoughts of mucking it out eventually? Um, this is something that I haven't run into, but I've been told that any kind of pond like this will build up muck in the bottom, and they'll have to go in there and get his compost out and scoop it out. Yeah. Yeah. So Scott? Do you use the pond all year round? Well, we just built it in the spring, and I expect that the plants will die in the winter. Uh, so we probably will not be using it in the winter. So then you're just going to store your wash water? We're going to compost the wash water. Like, okay. As I said, 50 gallons three times a week, that's 150 gallons, and we're producing about eight or 900 gallons a week. So we mostly compost it. How much do you add, like how, and how often to that smaller 
Um, the IBC wetlands, we've actually dismantled to, to make this one. Uh -huh. How many did it? How many? Um, we were doing about five gallons a day. Okay. I'm sorry. About five gallons a day. How much would you estimate this project was? Ish. How much did it cost? Well, if we want to do something like this, the same scale, how much would it cost us to do it? Um. I mean, it's hard to tell because I live in, I work at this crazy place, and there's all kinds of materials and equipment that we never have to rent, uh, we never have to buy. Um, I mean, I could say you had to buy a pond liner, and I bet it would be less than $200. Um, you can find these IVCs for free uh, when they're dirty or um, for like $150 when they've been cleaned out a little bit. Um, and you can make this tub out of it, you know, it doesn't have to be a particular size best to be about 12 to 18 inches deep. Um, there's a lot of options you can use for that. Um, the aquarium bubbler, the heavy duty one, probably costs $100. The waterfall circulator pump probably costs $100. Where do you find the dirty IVCs? Where do you find the Where can you find dirty IVCs for free? Uh, sometimes ink places get linseed oil in them to clean out their equipment and they'll be kind of mucky at the end. Um, sometimes a food processing facility will get them for olive oil or for fryer oil, and um, they have two different grades of IBCs, disposable ones, which is a ridiculous concept, and uh, long-term uh, DOT certified. Um, but the disposable ones, you can, you and I can use them for, you know, penny or I'm sure. Um, and they'll give you those ones if you come pick them up. Uh, I get some from a Whole Foods commissary. Concrete uh, batch plants, they get a soap that, and they like to get rid of those. Um, well, one of it is the plants, I mean, they go dormant during the winter and they like, come back when they fall or in the spring. Yeah. But um, I mean, when I was out in Pogo, I realized you guys a lot of uninhibited space to put a, uh, a solar heater up, um, especially if you look at the building. If you heat the water, you can still have bacterial action occurring at the bottom, in which that you can still pour some more wash water in there in this uh, liquor. But I mean, it's something you have to look at first is an initial investment. Or the no, investment would just be like lying black it was across the roof. Yeah, yeah. But it's one option. It, just keep it marginally warmer and marginally it'll still digest. What do you, that kind of ties in, do you uh, heat your wash water or anything to, I know some people are starting to do that to, to get good, good separation. Uh, to like break an emulsion that might be in the wash water? Yeah, basically just to make it more efficient, make your wash oh, more efficient. Um, you know what I didn't mention, but the, the mist wash that I did was hot water. Okay. I've got an water. instantaneous okay. hot water heater on the wall, and so before the water goes in, as a mist, it's heated up. So how warm is your water coming out? Um, um, I think it's about 150 degrees that goes in the wash. Then why it wasn't coming out, do you think? Um, that, that might help you out when you're winter. Yeah, it's an interesting idea, yeah. that it, it might retain the heat before it goes in there. Uh, well, there's a couple of resources I can recommend. Um, this book, I honestly think, even though it looks like a children's book, is probably your best resource. It's really fantastic and inspiring. Chattanooga Sludge. Uh, Damnation's a really interesting book I uh, have been reading. It's a lot of essays about why it's important to conserve water, um, places in the country that are having problems with water shortages, or um, some company might be controlling their water, so there's some sort of uh, democratization of water concerns. They also are the source of the diagram that you saw of the residential gray water system. And it's written by a group they call themselves the gray water gorillas. Um, but, but smart and um, helpful book. This one, I can only say that it exists. I actually ordered it, hoped that it would arrive before I left to come here, but I haven't never re read it. They have a website, oasisdesign.net, that's got a lot of really helpful resources. I, again, they're talking about residential gray water. I've got, I just got that book, and it's 
Okay. Yeah, uh, it's a, a lot of good plumbing tips. Oh, it sounds yeah. weird, but you know, a lot of good, you know, like, you know, keep your grades right, you know, always have how your to. sources, how to's. Good how to, and gives you a good idea of, of level of type of gray water system that you want. And it really concentrates on simple systems. Exactly. Oh, simple, okay. simple will function. Simply you will repair. To add on to that, um, we just did a permaculture workshop at our farm and there was a gray water component and we had Brad Lancaster, who's a pure desert dweller. He does rainwater and gray water harvesting and I can pass around and happen to have his little book card. So if anyone wants to see his website or the names of his books there, he's great. Um, I definitely linked to all of them. Awesome. Just uh, one last was one of the concerns is uh, you, a lot of the plants you will need vegetation. Any thoughts of when they start growing out, replacing what you took? When they start growing out, like when they start, and they will start growing out. They will uh, propagate new shoots. Ah. But uh, any thoughts of replacing the plants that are taken out, and maybe also if we contact the local. Uh, I mean, the wetland groups or watershed groups that you can actually cultivate wetland plants that they can then use and plant to recover wetlands. That's one of the days you're doing at school. Mm. So, uh, just uh, giving back to the nature that I took from? Yep. Um, That's a cool idea. I figure a high nutrient system, they grow very quickly, and you can take those plants and get out of it. <laughs> yeah, or maybe I can even do a share system where these ones are acclimated to biogas of wash water. Exactly. Got a head start. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about um, glycerin and compost. Uh huh. So you don't do methanol recovery, and it's a two part question. I'm wondering if you feel like the, wa the extra washing is flushing that out more. And I'm wondering about, you bury the glycerin in your compost pile, so do you have any sense of what happens to the methanol? So, the first part of your question is, um, if the washing reduces the methanol in the glycerin, it might dilute it a bit, but it won't reduce it. Uh, so, th so, say I'm composting 300 gallons of this crude biodiesel glycerol, it might have 40 or 50 gallons of methanol in it, which is kind of wasteful. And I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll be upgrading my system soon and actually got all the components together to make a methanol recovery system from our glycerin. Um, but the second part is what effect does the methanol have in the compost piles? Um, so from my understanding, there's bacteria that considers methanol preferred preferred food. And it'll eat methanol before it eats anything else in the compost pile. Um, I talked to a soil scientist at a, a company in Ohio. We send samples of our compost to be tested. And um, my boss asked me to talk to him because I'm the, the weird guy who's putting the weird things in the pile, so I should be the one who takes the heat for it. Um, so I talked to the soil scientist, and he said it sounded fantastic to him. And do you see that being a problem if the compost pile is not quite as large as the one that you guys have? If the compost pile is not as large, is it going to be a problem adding that much glycerin to it? Uh, the, I think the most important thing is to add an appropriate amount for an appropriate pile. So you could put glycerin in a home composting pile. You might only put a half a cup every month. But the concern that you're going to run into in a smaller pile are that this liquid is going to suffocate out the other activity in your pile. Our piles are so big and have so much structure in them that they're going to allow a lot of oxygen to flow and a lot of air flow in the piles. Uh, they're going to soak into a huge body of uh, other material. Question right there? Jen, um, if you put methanol in a composting pile and you're in a hot area like I am where it's 100 every day for like times 20 days in a row, the chance of spontaneous combustion. Uh, question is, is there a chance of spontaneous combustion in these piles? Does this add to the flammability of the compost? Well, as you would probably already know, in the middle of these compost piles, it can get very, very hot, and the compost piles on their own will spontaneously combust. 
and it's actually a major concern for an operation like ours. It happened about six or seven years ago, I wasn't there, but um, everybody said it was just this raging, um, not raging, but a, a big fire. This one was actually flaming, and uh, that they couldn't put it out. No one expected to be able to put it out. What you just had to do is move other things away from it and let it burn itself out. The way that we get around that is we measure the temperature and the oxygen of our compost piles every single day. We want them to be about 130, 140 degrees for healthy composting. And when they get higher than that, we have a problem. The way that we prevent them from getting higher than that is we turn the compost piles every month. So a compost pile is supposed to be, as you saw, it's like 12 feet tall, 300 feet long. It's supposed to be picked up one front end loader bucket at a time and moved over every month. By doing that, it turns all the material, exposes all new areas. The hot part on the inside might go down to the outside, and the bacterial and microorganism activity is spread out through the pile, so keep the temperature in that safe zone. Let's go back to the compost question. Um, do you have a feeling for the proportion of glycerin per compost pile that? Well, I can recommend a great piece <laughs> in this magazine. Uh, this woman, Allie Dethoff at Dickinson College, did some experiments and has a, a data chart in uh, the article that she wrote for this magazine. Um, and she talks about different concentrations of glycerin that she added to different piles and what sort of temperature that they rose to when they were decomposed. Which number is that one? This is number six. The call off is that we'll be releasing the end results of that study soon. So this is Andrew from Dickinson College. He said they've got some final conclusions from that study that they're going to be releasing soon.